Hello and welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton live from our New York City headquarters. We are giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. From today's top investing stories to Yahoo Finance's trending tickers to the macroeconomic forces shaping markets, we dig deeper into everything you need to know for that last hour of trading. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. We still see it kicking off in June, so I think the data that we've gotten hasn't necessarily pushed that back. Where we've seen the change is really in the pace that they're going to go afterwards. Um, you know, I think the improvement that we've already seen on the inflation side of the picture is enough uh, to give the Fed uh, some reason to start pulling back on rates. I don't think anybody's going to walk out of this event feeling less bullish on AI and NVIDIA's opportunity than they felt going in. <laughs> I fully expect them to sound very, very positive. I fully expect them to have very good things to say about their product roadmap and, and everything else that they're that they're that they're playing in. Identity is a big part of the defense, and that's why uh, we're so important to our customers stepping up, helping them defend themselves against these identity-based attacks. So we've got one hour to go until the market close. Let's show you where you are on the major averages and how we got here. Let's start with the Dow here, down about 187 points right now. That's off about a half of 1%. The S&P 500 also down about a half of 1%, and the Nasdaq down 8 tenths of 1%. Doesn't seem to be as much macro-driven today, but there are some interesting company stories that are pushing things lower. I also want to note today, by the way, that yesterday, just as we saw the rustle of small caps and the equal weight index underperforming forming the larger cap averages. Today, it's the opposite. We've got the Russell actually rebounding and the equal weights rebounding as well. Also got to check on what's going on in the bond market today after that big, big move that we saw in yields upward yesterday, kind of going sideways today at 4.3%. And then let's take a quick look at the sectors within the S&P 500 as well. It is tech that is leading declines today, as I mentioned. Some individual stock stories that are pulling the XLK down. Communication services also down. Com uh, consumer discretionary. And on the plus side, once again, we got the commodities in the driver's seat. We've got the XLE Energy ETF up, materials up as well. And in fact, we're going to tell you how to play some of the commodities in our playbook a little bit later in the show, Josh. Now you're watching one of those individual stocks I was referring to that's pulling things down. That's right, Julie. So let's talk about Adobe here. Not an easy day to be long this name. Adobe, you can see, is getting hit very hard in today's trade. It reports and disappoints. And really, it was about that sales outlook we know for the core quarter. That was not good enough for the street. Now, heading into this report, remember, some investors had already uh, been concerned about competition from AI-focused startups like OpenAI and how that would impact the market and Adobe's competitive positioning. Now, Adobe has responded, for example, with its own AI tool called Firefly, but investors are clearly concerned after this print. So how are bulls responding, Julie, by the way? Kirk Matern over at Evercore, uh, Kirk, very smart guy, telling his clients today he sees his pullback as an interesting buying opportunity. He sees most of the benefits from Firefly, he now says, shifting into 2025, sticks with that outperform rating, price target now 650. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely some other analysts who are questioning the competition that's out there over at Third Bridge. Uh, they're talking about that this plays directly into investors' narrative of AI-driven uncertainty within the company's operating environment. They point out, the analysts there, that the other businesses are performing pretty well, but it's in this AI area specifically that provides that area of sort of uncertainty or lack of clarity for Adobe. By the way, you know, we're looking ahead to NVIDIA's big developers conference coming early next week. Adobe has its own conference. Summit. Uh, yeah. Summit, exactly, right. that is coming towards the end of the month, the following week. And so we'll be watching to see if there's any kind of product announcements that may seek to reset the narrative around AI and Adobe. Yeah, that is that is Adobe's big user conference uh, coming up soon here. We've been talking to some Adobe analysts who were kind of excited about that conference. Huh? Maybe that's some news we could be expecting there. We'll see what headlines come. We will see what headlines come. In the meantime, Adobe not just dragging the shares down, but uh, as I mentioned, seeing kind of a weight on tech more broadly broadly today. Well, let's talk more about the broad outlook here. Stock sliding today, setting up Wall Street for a weekly loss as investors weighing the impact of those hot inflation prints 
Focus now turning to next week's Federal Reserve policy decision and the dot plot, the expectations that the Fed will hold off cutting rates till June. How can investors play a more patient Fed? For more, let's welcome in Rayan Mitrione, Callan Family Office Investment Management Partner, who's with us in studio. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So this is the big question that a lot of people seem to be wondering. And I have seen some analysts and economists start to say, even if the Fed doesn't cut this year, stocks will be okay. What do you think? I think that's entirely possible. I mean, the market has priced it in and, and is hoping that we start to trend in the right direction. But right now, the economy's strong, right? I mean, we have um, the employment market is incredibly strong. We got jobs that are you know, staying reasonably strong. Unemployment rate is near historical lows. Consumers are still spending. So we're in a really you know, strong spot. And as long as the economy stays strong, the market should stay strong. Now, if the Fed were to move too quickly and cut rates too soon and then have to reverse course if inflation started to trend back up, that would be a concern for the markets. So, so you think the risk is weighted towards the Fed cutting too soon rather than waiting? Yes. I think also the Fed has, I mean, they've been very clear that there was, you know, they are going to be patient. They're going to be data dependent. They're looking at what's happening. And, you know, the last couple months, the inflation prints have been a little bit hotter than they probably want to see. Uh, but they had always essentially said it was probably going to be the back half of the year. And that's, that's still what we expect, that we'll probably have two to three more. But it'll really be dependent on what we see over the next couple months, I think. Do you, uh, Rianne, also, you know, you're seeing a number of strategies kind of expect, given the, the rally we've had. They're saying, listen, at this point, we're kind of overdue for a pullback. Pullback generally defined as, you know, drop somewhere between 5 10 percent. Are you looking for that? And if we saw that kind of pullback, would you see that as a buying opportunity? I mean, we've certainly had a strong start to the year, right? I mean, we're up, you know, eight percent ish on the S and P. Uh, it's been a strong start. I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of rockiness, um, especially with what we had this week with inflation. Or, you know, tech has been very extended. We've seen that broaden out some, um, but especially if we think rates are going to stay higher for longer, that could be a headwind for some of those shares. Um, we're still pretty fully allocated right now as far as our equity allocations. Uh, I Depending on how much of a pullback it is, we may view it as a buying opportunity. But if we just get, you know, a five percent pullback, I think we're pretty comfortable with where we stand today. Well, and then I guess the question is, are you participating in the pullback? In other words, you know, the, the run up that we've seen in tech, have you been sort of lightening some of your allocations there? Absolutely. I mean, after last year was such a strong market, I mean, especially for the Magnificent Seven. So especially looking at those mega cap tech names. Um, we have been taking some of those profits off the table. We still have a full weighting as far as tech goes, but you know, pulling back some of that overweight that it had grown into and looking at other areas that are just more attractively priced right like, now. Like what, Rianne? What would those other areas be? So, I mean, we're keeping a pretty balanced allocation between growth and value. So taking some of that and maybe allocating to um, healthcare and consumer staples, consumer discretionary areas that are just haven't really participated nearly as much um, to balance out the portfolios. And then what about on the fixed income side as well, right? Because um, there, we've seen this run up in yields that's been happening recently, right. but we know a lot of investors still have money parked in things like money market funds. So how are you thinking about that area? Yeah, it's, I mean, now versus a few years ago, I mean, we, you can be diversified. You can own fixed income and actually get something out of it. You can even own cash and money market and, and at least get some sort of yield. So we have, um, we are pretty neutral. Our equity targets and our fixed income targets after being you know, overweight equities and very underweight and defensive on fixed income for some time. Um, we are, you know, we've added back into bonds um, and shifted that out to more of an intermediate duration from being more defensive on the short end. Uh, so we, we have our, our clients pretty well diversified, but we still, we're still constructive on the equity markets. And you know, we're going to be talking commodities late, later in the show, and some of them have just this incredible run of gold and you know, record highs here. Have you participated in that at all? Do you own the metal or the miners? Um, we do through some of through some of the managers that we work with, but we don't typically have a direct allocation there. Um, we invest some in the in the real assets on the private side, um, but that would be more on you know more real estate. I mean, how focus. closely though are you watching the commodities more as sort of a macro indicator, even a headwind, mm -hmm. and especially as they play into the inflation story too? Well, absolutely, and that was and you have kind of that last year the don't fight the Fed on the commodity story, um, but this year it's switched a little where you know we have energy prices coming back up, and I mean energy stocks had been 
you know, they're they're still at a discount. They're still very attractive on, you know, and we've seen energy prices and oil prices come back up this year. So it's um, certainly been what was factoring in this week on the inflation that we've seen. Energy was a big piece of that. And it's definitely something that we're looking closely at as far as what could come further that down the pike this year. And, and I admit, I must have, uh, I have energy on the brain because I'm actually about to go to Sarah Week, which is the big annual oil and uh, gas conference that happens in Houston every year. And, you know, there's been a lot going on in the energy industry, a lot of M&A. Um, but, you know, as an investor, why own the energy? Is it about um, capital return to shareholders? Is it about, I mean, I don't know how much growth you're looking for from the industry. How do you think about that group? Oh, I mean, there are different ways to, to look at it. I mean, you can look at it as a diversifier, something to be a little bit different from the other asset classes that you own. Um, you can look at it as an inflation hedge. Um, and you can look at it, you know, we invest some in the MLP markets. Mm -hmm. You just certainly can earn some income there, which is great. And that's been a great place over the last couple of years to be invested. All right, Anne, thanks for coming in. Thanks really for having me. appreciate it. Well, we're just getting started here on Market Domination. Coming up, the National Association of Realtors set to pay $418 million to settle a real estate agent commission lawsuit, or more than one. That has shares of real estate stocks taking a hit today. We'll check in on the sector and a few other trending tickers later in the hour. Plus, cloud security company Zscaler diving deeper into the world of AI. We'll speak to the CEO at 4 p.m. about the latest moves. And the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye, will get investor insight on two stocks to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stick around, more market domination, so it'll come.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Of course, the tech space has been inundated with companies looking to, into, to tap into generative AI. But what's the best way to play this ever-growing AI arena? I'm here with Dave Mazza, Roundhill Investments Chief Strategy Officer. Dave, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me. So let's get to your buy stock, and it is Baidu. Baidu. Uh, interesting here. Don't hear too many folks too many folks talking about Chinese AI plays right now, but let's get into it and why you like it. First of all, you say it's got a diversified business model. Indeed. So Baidu, known as the Google of China, and by, by that it means obviously a core part is their search business, but they're involved with a little bit of everything, including autonomous vehicles and generative AI. Of course, the background, as we saw with that chart, has been pretty challenging. If we were to look at a longer term chart, wouldn't be much prettier either. Yeah, so, but that's actually, you say, part of the thing that makes it a good play right now because it's come down so much? Yeah, exactly. So the macro concerns have really weighed on the stock, right? Most people have not ignored any of the positive fundamentals and focused just on the fact that it's China related and China names have it on a favor for geopolitical reasons, macroeconomic concerns, what have you. But bottom line, it's now trading at some of its lowest levels ever since it listed. And that translates to a 10x forward times priced earnings. Where can you find a tech stock as diversified as Baidu is at 10 times forward earnings? Pretty hard to find, especially in the US. Yeah, it's true. And, but let's talk about the Gen AI part of it specifically. So what is Baidu doing on that front? And how is it going to help boost profitability for the company? Yeah, of course. So a lot of companies are talking about generative AI, but less are actually doing it. Baidu is an example where they are plowing money into generative AI. That's loss making right now. But what they have is called ErnieBot. Yeah. So we're focused on and ChatGBT, that's a basically trained on English language, large language model. ErnieBot is Chinese, uh, using ch uh, the Chinese language, and so what that means is that the results are actually more accurate there. So that's just one example of what the company's involved in, but generative AI is a big part of its push forward, and you can imagine them integrating that into search and into other applications like a Microsoft is today. Hmm. Uh, we have to talk about the risk whenever we talk about a buy stock. And here the risk is pretty obvious because we've already seen it, as you said, affect the stock. And that is its focus on China and the sort of macro headwinds and unpredictability of yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And the reason why investors have re-rated these stocks down is because of it's really hard to quantify what's going to happen in China. Uh, and there's been so much concern. But again, if you look at the valuations at 10 times forward, the revenue growth remains there. To me, this is really thinking about, unless you believe that something catastrophic is going to happen in China, if you're looking for attractive tech valuations, a name like this might fit the bill. So in other words, effectively, it's priced in some of the China risk already and perhaps overpriced in that China That's what risk. we believe. We think at this point, shares, the shared uh, decline has been too extended. And again, for investors looking for an opportunity, a name like Baidu could be there. And you have some of that more margin of safety at this point with 10 times forward earnings. All right, let's get to the stock you're avoiding here. And this has been a popular one, which you say maybe is part of the problem. Arm holding is what we're talking about here. The stock has really skyrocketed, especially this year. But here, you know, the part of the company's sort of selling point when it did go public was this Gen AI opportunity. But you think it's overstated? Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's hard to uh, say goodbye to a stock with a chart looking like that. Yeah. But to your point, that's part of the story. Really, since uh, their IPO, their reintroduction as a public company, they've just they've just soared. Um, but. Our concern is when we think about, again, generative AI, is it going to happen for them now? We know they're involved with NVIDIA. That's known in the price. What other deals are they, gonna, are, are they going to sign on? A bigger concern to us is their involvement with Apple and Apple smartphones and MacBooks, what have you, because they are licensing and the royalties from the chips there are a big part of ARM's business. And the question is, does that really start translating anytime soon? We actually think some of the, cons the, the Apple concerns could bleed mm -hmm. into that and overwhelm anything positive from Gen AI. Interesting. OK, let's get to the second point here, competition in chip design. In some cases, you know, from the hyperscalers themselves, in some cases, other chip companies. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we're seeing companies begin to design their own chips, actually kind of leverage some of the learnings that maybe they've had with ARM, uh, or just simply the fact that everyone's getting into it. There's tons of catch up happening with NVIDIA, and whether it's AMD, uh, at some point Intel will we'll, mm -hmm. we'll figure it out, and others, is that the chip space, the cyclicality there is still uh, something that, that investors cannot ignore. And ARM, I think, is a little bit uh, more subjective to the competition than other, other players may be. And then finally here, 
other significant risks that we're looking at to the business? Yeah, I think there's just other risks with arms that, that we may not be aware of, particularly on that valuation side, right? If we're, we're, they are trading at 100 times forward earnings. And so even, even if this company has an excellent business model, you have to understand what you're, what, what you're getting here. And 100 times forward earnings, let alone the insane price that they're trading at on a revenue basis, yeah. uh, I think there's just a lot of risk there stepping into the name now. Yeah, I guess the phrase pr price to, to perfection was invented for Indeed. a situation like this. So let's talk about the risk to the downside here. It's that the stock could correct, right? And maybe then it would be a better entrance. Here's the interesting thing. When we think about opportunities in general AI, there's going to be a lot of names that are going to be exciting. This name to us has those elements, just not at 100 times forward earnings. And so interesting enough, a risk to the case is, uh, uh, does actually SoftBank, which remains a large owner of this, mm -hmm. not actually uh, sell? And then at some point, investors who have been on the sidelines or the short sellers, which were absolutely burned in the last earnings, have to give up uh, and say that this becomes oh, a buy. But for the time being, we're waiting for a pullback before adding. Gotcha. Okay. And just a quickly disclosures on this buy. Do I believe you guys hold this in yes. some of your portfolios? That's correct. Yeah, we actually, it's uh, one of our largest holdings in our chat ETF, which is the Roundhill Generative AI and Technology ETF. Uh, so want to, want to make sure folks are aware of that. Yeah, an arm, no position in arm. No position in arm. Okay, Dave, let's summarize the case you're making to investors here. You say people should look at buying Baidu based on that diversified business model, attractive valuation efforts, and expanding generative AI with Ernie Bot. On the other side, you're saying avoid arm. It's facing rising competition, and its true involvement in generative AI right now, at least, has been overstated along with that soaring stock price. Thank you so much, Dave, for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Snowflake gets an upgrade from Guggenheim, the firm raising its rating on the stock from sell to neutral. So Guggenheim, Julie, feeling a bit better about Snowflake. They go to neutral, so they're on the sidelines. Analyst does see a mountain of challenges for the software company. His words, not exactly a, a ringing endorsement, no. uh, but does say, listen, the near-term setup looks attractive, he told his clients. In fiscal 2025 guidance, he says, in his opinion, it looks beatable here. Yeah, and, and he sort of looks at all of the negatives that have piled up, that mountain that you referred to, yep. including the unexpected resignation of CEO Frank Slootman. Um, the shares are, are down quite a bit, as you can see there. And so this sort of takes that into account and asks the question, as you always ask, how much of this is priced in? Something else that also caught my eye is that the analyst has been doing sort of channel checks, if you will, mm -hmm. at, talking to Snowflake clients and they indicate optimism that could materialize into consumption in the coming quarters. Now that's still kind of provisional, right? Optimism that could materialize okay. into consumption. So it's still, you can see why it's still a neutral here and not yeah, a Yeah, I thought it was, he also talked about that, you know, you mentioned the surprising departure of, yes. of Slootman, which caught a lot of people off guard, of course. Says it's unclear what that means for the company, but noted that the CFO talked about wanting to set up the new CEO for success when considering the guidance they offered. In other words, he thinks the CFO is, you know, being kind of prudent with the forecast, given that there's a new guy in charge of. And, and just quickly as well, you know, the analyst also talked about um, that Snowflake is at core a cloud data warehousing company, but has had aspirations to expand beyond that. And still, it's unclear whether they're going to be able to successfully do that, which I yeah, thought they, was an they interesting They reported, remember, point. last month, I remember we talked mm -hmm. about it, and just got hammered um, on the surprise yeah. exit. It's a slip, and also disappointing sales forecast. That stock's down, down about 20% this year. Yes. Um, let's talk about another one we're watching today. That is Citi propping up shares of Micron after lifting its target price on the stock. The move coming ahead of Micron's earnings next week. Citi expecting good results and guidance from the chip maker here. The shares up some 2% in today's session. And a lot of this has to do with um, potentially new products coming to market that are going to be helpful here, including um, some of its higher bandwidth memory um, chips that the company is shipping and its ability to tap into some of the demand for AI with some of those chips. Yeah, so, so when they report next week, he's saying, listen, I think they're going to, I think they were going to report and they're going to beat. He thinks they're going to increase guidance. So he sees a lot of reasons for optimism here. He calls uh, out strong DRAM pricing, says they're shipping higher priced, uh, higher margin products. By the way, the team at Cowan 
also weighed in on Micron Ooh. today, um, also positive. They boosted their price target to 120. And stock is already up about 10% this year, Julie. It's up about 70% over the past 12 months. So expectations riding high into this print next week. Yeah, one of the other details here that I thought was interesting, average selling prices, according to the City Note for DRAM, uh, which is a type of, um, of ch memory chips, average selling prices will increase 52% in 2024, according to City, because of limited production growth and because of demand surrounding AI. So that would be quite a boost in prices if yeah, that ends up materializing. It's here to note that, you know, Micron shipping with NVIDIA systems, so you're sprinkling some of that AI over it. Always I love helps, the magic. All sure. right, let's talk about another story that is developing here. Prosecutors weighing in on the sentencing of Sam Bankman Freed. They say that he should face 40 to 50 years for his role in the collapse of FTX here. Um, and this came out of a filing of the U.S. in the U.S. District Court in Manhattan, which was uh, included the sentencing recommendation, the hearing at which that will actually be determined is scheduled for March 28th. Yeah, it's interesting because a sentence of, so ranging from 40 to 50 years. Um, Bloomberg actually points out the request is actually far less though than the 100 yes. years recommended in U.S. criminal sentencing guidelines, but of course, not surprising a lot more than, than his lawyers were asking for. I think a key line here, prosecutors saying in the filing, in every part of his business and with respect to each crime committed, the defendant demonstrated a brazen disrespect for the rule of law. He understood the rules, but decided they did not apply to him. Yeah, and his lawyers in the meantime, last month had said he should get six and a half years. Correct. Yeah. So obviously, 40 to 50 is a lot more than that and a lot less than the yeah, 100 it'll, or so. It'll be interesting to see what the judge does here because remember their relationship, uh, Rocky, at times, and yeah. also does the judge decide, you know, on March 28th that, you know, he's going to make an example here um, just to kind of warn others of, of trending down the same path. All right. As yeah. this goes on in the background, we are seeing a decline in Bitcoin prices today. Of course, we've seen this big run up. Huge. And Remarkable uh, a little bit of a pullback here today. Well, coming up, we are checking in on some of today's top trending tickers, including shares of real estate stocks taking a hit. That and much more when market domination returns.
Time now to check in on some trending tickers as the closing bell on Wall Street quickly approaches. Starting with a look at the real estate space, the National Association of Realtors to pay $418 million to settle the Real Estate Agent Commission lawsuits. Shares of real estate stocks, you can see there, such as Zillow and Compass, taking a hit following the lawsuit settlement. Yahoo Finance's very own Danny Romero here with the latest. Danny. Say sayonara to those 6% commission fees. The NAR announced this settlement, this million dollar settlement, but there's a couple new rules. So I want to lay those out. So for one, the new rules include it prohibits agents' compensations from being included on local centralized listing portals. The NAR had required sellers to include that compensation when listing a home on this multiple listing service database. That no longer is required. Two, a new rule. It ends the requirement that brokers must subscribe to this multiple listings service, which many are owned by the NAR local branches. And the last new rule is that it requires buyers brokers to enter into a written agreement with their buyers. And some Wall Street analysts have been saying that this uh, new settlement could uh, cause commissions to drop by 25 percent, 25 to 50 percent. And then also it does open the opportunity for these discount brokerages to really get some skin in the game. But again, what does this mean for home buying now, right? There's two sides to this story. So for home buying, buyers can now shop around on rates and see before they commit to buying a home. Another thing is that brokers can now start advertising their fees and allow customers to pick a lower cost agent. I don't know if that's really gonna go somewhere, but that's allowed now. Uh, and then buyers also have to sign an agreement detailing how much they are willing to pay their agent for their services. Agents representing buyers can now negotiate that too about, you know, I'm requiring this amount. It could either be, the bills could either be a monthly bill or it could be just one flat fee, but it definitely is changing the game. But at the end of the day, this agreement, this settlement really does need to be going to, it's gonna to go to federal court. So there needs to be approval on that at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a lot of unknowns still. So let's talk about this a little more. Thank you so much, Danny, appreciate it. And let's get more on the ripple effects from this real estate commission settlement and bring in Resi Club co-founder and CEO Lance Lambert. Lance, I think we're all trying to wrap our heads around what this is going to mean here. Um, can you sort of lay out here, in your view, what big changes this settlement is going to make to the home buying process? Yeah, so this is a bit of an earthquake for the industry. Uh, you know, historically speaking, how it's worked in the U.S. for a long time is that the total commission has been around 6% in a lot of markets, where 3% goes to the buyer's agent, 3% maybe the sellers, and it varies by market. But usually the seller was paying that. And it was taken as kind of granted that that's just how the process worked. Now, heading forward with it no longer being uh, in the MLS and it's going to be negotiated more, I think there's a potential here that, you know, the total commission pie could be decreased. And I think the winner might be sellers who might get out of pain for the buyer's uh, agent. Uh, and picking up that piece of it, Lance. So can I can I ask you a quick here, can I ask you a quick follow on this? Yeah, yeah. Why was why was it ever structured that the sellers paid the whole fee? Well, that uh, the thinking being that anyone who's selling has also been on the other side of it buying, right? And so if you're on the selling side of it and you pay both, yeah, maybe that sucks but when you got <laughs> into the market you didn't pay for it right so that was kind of how the process worked and it's one of those things where once it became part of the system it just kind of stuck and now we're going to see you know how sticky it really is and we'll probably see the total pie uh, for commissions go down that's why i think uh, a lot of these stocks like zillow is down uh, compass is down today uh, the market kind of pricing that in uh, but it's going to take a while to play out, and there's probably going to be more lawsuits. But the big backdrop here is that housing affordability has deteriorated to levels not seen in about four decades. This is the worst housing affordability since the early 80s when mortgage rates were 18 percent. And yes, yeah, 7 percent mortgage rates might not sound that bad. But when you take into how much take into account how much prices have risen and that incomes haven't kept pace, this mortgage rate shock going from three to seven has really strained it. 
And so the trickle of the impact of that with uh, affordability being so strained is that people are stressed. And uh, that stress on affordability is creating things like this, where there's more pressure on to get commissions down. There's more uh, local push against Airbnbs. There's more, uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to trickle into the political system as well. And you're already seeing a lot of talk against like institutional home buyers and different parts of housing just because affordability has become so strained that the it, it's natural that there's going to be a public pushback. And, uh, you know, I, I think some of the industry is just kind of going to get pinched by that. And when you, when you, Lance, when you say, you know, we talk about commissions dropping here, are, are you able to kind of quantify that in any way? I, I mean, I've already seen estimates out there, Lance, maybe 25, 30 percent I've seen. Yeah, it, it's going to take time to kind of figure that out. Um, you know, there are lots of guesses. Maybe it's 20 percent, maybe it's 30 percent. In some places, it might not be much at all. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of speculation there. And that's what it is. It's speculation. So we'll kind of have to see. How, how the cookie kind of crumbles here. Well, Lance, I think we're also trying to figure out not just how it's going to affect people who are trying to sell, buy and sell homes, not just how it's going to affect sort of realtors as an industry, but of course we here like to watch public companies. So we're trying to figure out what is it going to mean for Compass? What is it going to mean for Redfin? What is it going to mean for Zillow? Um, is there anything that we can say now or, or what questions should we be asking as it pertains to those specifically? Yeah, there there has been some bearish sentiment that's come out against Zillow. Uh, Spruce, uh, you know, they just recently put them uh, in the short category. You know, they're a short selling firm, um, and their argument against Zillow is one: uh, what's happening in, to the commission side? And remember that Zillow is a lead generation company. They create leads for real estate agents. So if the total pie of realtors and real estate agents in the country shrinks that negatively impacts Zillow. But there's another thing that's happening to Zillow, and that's this company, which is very savvy, CoStar, has come into the space. They have apartments.com, and now they have homes.com that's a direct competitor to Zillow. And by the way, they are not, they're not gonna you know, just kind of limp in. They're taking a big swing. They're actually doing the largest ever real estate marketing campaign. They have, what, like three Super Bowl ads. Uh, they're everywhere right now. So homes.com uh, from one side of the competition and then the other side of the macro, uh, th that's definitely having an impact on Zillow. And look today, Zillow stock is down 14% in one day. Yeah. Lance, thank you so much as always for joining the show and helping us kind of walk through a complicated topic here, Lance. Have a great weekend. Turning now to the world of biotech, Drew, we've got a couple different headlines here. We had, let's start with Geron. So that wow. one was soaring today, right? Secured the back of an FDA advisory panel for its anemia drug candidate. Investors, I mean, they obviously like it. Street does too. Stiefel calling this overwhelmingly positive because the vote was so lopsided. It was 12 to 2. Expects the decision, they say, to pave a clear path to regulatory approval in June. Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at these sort of developmental stage biotechs here, and this is a, this company doesn't have a product yet, so if it right. has this product, it, you can see why it is such a um, you know a, an outcome that's either a yes or no outcome mm -hmm. effectively here. So that's why you're seeing it go up so much here for this anemia drug. So you have that, and then there is another example of this today, this same situation with a company called Madrigal Pharmaceuticals. This has an experimental. Uh, drug to treat a deadly liver disease, um, and it got accelerated uh, FDA approval to treat uh, patients with this particular type of liver, liver disease, which is a non-alcoholic type of liver disease here. It's fairly expensive to get this, uh, which is 000. about 47000 a year, exactly. Uh, but analysts are pretty positive on this. Um, it's called NASH, by the way, this disorder, mm -hmm. if you, uh, the acronym is it. Is and a bunch of other companies have tried and failed to come up with treatments for Bristol it. Myers, Gilead. Although it was also interesting to see um, Viking Therapeutics was up at one point today too because they apparently also developing a therapy for this same disease. Right, but I, I, these these biotech stories are just so fascinating to me because everything is riding on these experimental drugs and whether they get through. And that's why you see such big, I mean, not quite as big for Madrigal right. as it was for Jaron, but nonetheless, that's why you see such big big swings in the stocks. Um, let's get to quite a different story here.
Premier Jay Bull, those shares dropping as the contract manufacturer slashed its fiscal 2024 guidance. Jay Bull also delivered lower than expected revenue for its fiscal second quarter here. And the CEO kind of trying to couch this, uh, saying in a statement that fiscal year 24 was always going to be a transitional year for the company. Um, it had sold off its mobility business and had been trying to sort of right size its footprint. But yep. investors don't seem like they're going to be too patient. No, never never good when you lower your, your outlook for the f full fiscal year and investors are reacting. Um, you know, the CEO did talk about, you know, he highlighted what he called revenue uh, headwinds, Julie. Mm -hmm. Now, he was trying to emphasize in the statement that these were short term, but investors clearly aren't waiting around. Um, the, the CEO, as you noted, said the fiscal year was going to be a transitional one. It is interesting. I mean, the street is overwhelmingly positive on this name. You don't have a single sell, but you can see the reaction in today's trade. Yeah, I mean, even with the drop today, the shares are still up like 50% yeah, over the run. past year. Well, coming up in our investor playbook, we're diving into how to invest in the commodity space where we have seen a lot of action recently. Stay tuned, more market domination coming your way next. American workers are becoming more productive. This coming from recent Bank of America analysis showing the average revenue per worker for S&P 500 companies hitting an all-time high. For more, we're bringing in Yahoo Finance's very own Joshua Schaefer. Josh. Yeah, Josh. So obviously the overall takeaway there would be if companies are making more revenue per their employees that they have, that would just be considered a good thing, right? Companies want to make more revenue because growing more revenue is eventually going to help you make more money. I think there's sort of a broad 
simple takeaway there, but diving into the economics of it, labor productivity has been a big topic for a lot of economists in the past couple months, and a large reason that that's become such a big part of the conversation is when you look at wage growth. So wage growth just came in at 4.3% in the jobs report last week. It's still significantly higher than where economists think the Fed would want to see it. Economists have estimated that that number should come down to maybe 3.5% to get us to that 2% inflation target. But the key to labor productivity and why it matters so much is when labor productivity goes up, you can have higher wage growth. Because higher wage growth, right, if we think about this from sort of a simple economic standpoint, if I'm making more money, I'm willing to spend more on goods, right? So goods prices would go up. But if we're making more, if labor productivity goes up too, then we have both supply and demand rising. And for those of us that took Economics 101, that would mean that prices can stay the same, right? So it would not be an inflationary problem. There's also another part of this productivity story where just it might help company margins. And I think that that's something a lot of strategists were highlighting. That, that's why Bank of America was pointing this out. This was part of their S&P to 5,400 for the end of the year call and sort of their overall ESP, okay. EPS story. So connect those dots for us then. Yeah. How do you get from better productivity to S&P 5,400? Sure, yeah. So a, a part of it is because simply you're going to make more money and then you company as companies you get to decide what to do with it right so it could directly just go into a margin boost and you could see margins go up as productivity goes up or there's sort of another side of this too that B of A was highlighting which is interesting where if productivity is going up and your top line is going up you could also invest more back into your business and increase capex right and Bank of America in our chart of the day. I'll shout out our chart of the day from the Yahoo Finance Morning Brief newsletter that we had this morning. But Bank of America was pointing out that the CapEx increases that we're seeing from Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, uh, NVIDIA, you could argue, but really the cloud companies, so I shouldn't include NVIDIA in that. Mm -hmm. Overall, the CapEx spend that we're seeing there is going to help the rest of the economy. Because what does it take to build more AI in these companies and build more cloud? It's going to take more energy, right? It's going to take more old economy. They, B of A basically lays out a case that these old economy companies, companies in the utility sector, companies in the energy sector, they're capex takers. When these big tech companies want to spend, these other companies benefit from that. So it's good for tech, which we know is always good for the stock market. We talk a lot about tech stocks mm -hmm. going up. But it's also good for other companies and that's how you get to S&P 5400, Julie, really, is a little bit more than tech. It's the benefits that these mm. other companies could potentially see as the economy picks up. Interesting. We'll see if it plays out that way. Thanks, we Josh. <laughs> <laughs> well, with less than 15 minutes left until the closing bell on Wall Street, we're looking at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. Some of the biggest moves in the market this week have been in the commodity space. Cocoa prices extending their record run, topping $8,000 per metric ton. And checking on the metals as well, copper hitting its highest level in nearly a year. And also, oh, there's oil. Oh, let's mention that as well, because it's closing up more than 3% this week, despite edging a little bit lower today. Joining us now to break it all down, Blue Line Futures Chief Market Strategist Phil Striebel and Path Trading Partners co-founder and Chief Market Strategist Bob Iacchino. Guys, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Good to Thanks see you, Julie. So obviously there's a lot of commodities out there. We've been seeing a lot of action. So if you're an investor and you want to get involved here, you know, it, it's kind of a tricky thing to try to figure out. Bob, I want to start with you. Is there anything that can be said about commodities sort of writ large, or do we really need to drill down and talk about each one individually? Well, I think individual is valuable, and Phil's really good at that. But I, I just, on a broader sense, you are talking about something that is really a pure supply and demand story. And I think that escapes a lot of people. You're not gonna have CEO scandals with commodities. Uh, you're not gonna have missed earnings with commodities. You're talking about how much is out there, what does the supply picture look like, and what does the demand picture look like? And that's all it is. Now, while it can get complex with uh, different sort of geopolitical volatilities, especially in the place of crude oil, uh, we're talking about crude oil, that comes into play quite a bit. Inflation with gold, interest rates with some of the metals, including copper. The bigger picture is supply and demand. How much is there and who wants to buy it? So Phil, let's bring you in here too and, and, and dig deeper into a, a few different areas. Walk me through, Phil, I guess to start, how you're thinking about the energy complex, Phil, and, and oil in particular here, highest level here since November. Uh, what's driving that, Phil, and, and what do you see ahead? 
Yeah, so building on what Bob brought up, and it's a great point here, you look at crude oil, you look at the demand and the resiliency of the U.S. economy has helped support the demand. We've got driving season right here, and any kind of interest rate cut could really be a tailwind for the crude oil market. If you get some of this loan, some of this debt burden behind us with lower interest rates, people are going to have more money to spend, and they're probably going to do it the easiest way, which is travel. So we're starting to see 2024 demand increasing, and we can see upward revisions in 2025 and 2026. You look at the supply side of things, we saw Ukrainian drone attacks on Russian refineries that could impact some of the Russian exports. We've also seen surprise drawdowns in EIA inventories of 1.5 million barrels this week, taking the yearly decline down to 33 million barrels. So you look at the bigger picture things, like on the supply side, inventories are sitting at 446 million barrels versus the five-year average of 528. So one other thing that Bob didn't bring up was price momentum that also plays a big role and you want to see those prices really moving in the direction that outlines and maps with the supply and demand picture and crude oil prices look like they can go up to about 85 dollars right now um so bob do you agree i understand your long oil and i would ask no. where you're expecting it to go and also how you think the best way is for people to play i mean you're a sophisticated investor in this stuff right so you're probably looking at crude oil futures etc yes for normal investors should they be looking at etf should they go to the futures market what, what's best well i always advise people that you know the the thing that's 100 percent correlated to crude oil is crude oil <laughs> so the best place to play with that or play that out, I should say, we don't play in investing, is WTI crude. That's my favorite. But for the average investor, you can look at USO. That's one of the ETFs people just generally default to. And for example, looking at SIBO Newsfeed, which is a new product from them, I'm seeing that USO is projected to be lower than their average daily, daily volume, but the activity is on the call side of things. So to Phil's point about price momentum, and he's right, I did leave that out and it's very important. Uh, my target on this was 82.50, Phil says 85, so I'm probably gonna move it up to 85 now <laughs> on the WTI. But the USO thing is very important because your average investor is looking at that when the activity is to the call side, that means the market makers are going to be slowly buying up USO if the volatility rises. One thing about crude oil, volatility in the equity markets, we generally associate that with a down move. Volatility in something like crude could go either way in a spike in volatility, in which case the calls would be active then, w could come on an up move, and generally it does because we get a big supply disruption, like Phil mentioned, attacks on oil producers. That can cause supply disruptions and bring about volatility. Phil, let's, let's get you back in here. I want to switch gears here a bit, talk about gold, Phil, which, which has also been making a lot of headlines, and for good reason, strong run, Phil. It's near record highs. What do you think is driving that, Phil? Um, and what do you see well, ahead? And, and how are you, if at all, playing that? Yeah, with the metal, mm -hmm. the miners, both? Yeah, when it, when it talks about gold right now, I mean, we saw prices stall out right at about $2,200. We've come back from here. We're digesting, you know, higher inflation data, also a very very good economy right now. And those are things that prevent Fed Chairman Jerome Powell from cutting interest rates. And we've seen those interest rate expectations decline here recently. So I think that, you know, gold needs a lot right now. It needs more clarity as far as the first interest rate cut. It needs to close over 2200 to reignite the bulls. And it needs, you know, Bitcoin to stop stealing the thunder of all the ETF inflows. So one thing to note on gold is that it's always the timing, the pace and the depth of the interest rate cuts. And then finally, a study back from 1990 shows that after that first interest rate cut, after a, an upward cycle, Gold has on average rallied 6% in the first 30 days. So keep that in your back pocket. Yeah, are you are you willing to ride it there, Bob, as well, given some, some of those factors that <laughs> Phil talked about? Yes, so I had an interview at the end of 2022 where I called gold my uh, most likely trade for 2023. I bought it in November of 2022. And I still have it, and I have physical, and I've been in and out of the futures contract from the long side. So the reason I like gold here is because a lot of things have to happen for gold to go lower in a meaningful way. And what I mean by that is the Fed actually has to pivot. People like to talk about gold as an inflation hedge. It's not if the Fed is active. Okay, because if the Fed is active against inflation, they're hiking rates, and that's negative gold. But if you have a Fed that is poised to be either neutral or dovish, 
This one, I would argue, is dovish, right? I don't think the Fed should cut rates, but I think they're going to. Gold will likely benefit from that, as Phil described. So if you get the Fed pivoting because inflation is reflating, which I think it's going to, then gold's going to be in a little bit of trouble. But I think we're going into a reflationary environment, meaning higher stocks, higher commodity prices, higher inflation, and higher gold. And the Fed is not likely to pivot to tighter monetary policy stance. So I like gold here as much as, not as much, but because it was cheaper in 2022. But I like it here for at least the first quarter of this year. And Phil, we can't talk uh, commodities here without getting your take on cocoa, Phil. Uh, this one has just been surging, hitting fresh records. Phil, w what is driving that? And, and what do you see ahead? Any end in sight here? I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty volatile contract. You had a 9% move today. That's a 700 point rally in cocoa. That's a $7,000 move. So again, from a risk management standpoint, you got to have a plan and what percentage of your capital are you going to have at a risk? This cocoa story has been something that's been developing over the last few years, really since the Ukraine-Russia conflict, because a lot of the pesticides, a lot of the fertilizers came from Russia. The Ivory Coast was shut off. So that crop has been behind the eight ball for a few years now. Once you saw the news break that those forward contracts were being canceled, you had to know that companies like Nestle and other, you know, cocoa utilizers are going to be scrambling to get any kind of near-term supply. There was something a little bit off on the price action yesterday where you looked at the deferred contracts, they all closed lower. So the squeeze is really on the first you know, four months out here, but that's a contract, you know, Bob's probably got a better way to play on that with some ETF or something, because there's not a mini, there's not a micro contract. What percentage of your capital you want to be at risk? You might want to just let this one go and just, uh, you know, stock up on some Cadbury eggs for Easter or something. Stocking up on Cadbury eggs. Never, never a bad recommendation, Phil. Phil, Bob, thank you guys both for joining the show today. Have a great weekend. You as Thanks. well. Thank you. Well, we're wrapping up today's market domination. Don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination overtime.
There is the closing bell on Wall Street. Looks like folks looking ahead to St. Patrick's Day. It's market domination overtime. And Josh and I are here to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. I wanted to start with actually a look at the week here. Now, we did finish down on the Dow by about 191 points off a half a percent. Little changed on the week, however, but stopping the upward momentum that we have been seeing for stocks. The S&P 500 also lower on the week, but just about a tenth of one percent off about two thirds of a percent on the day. And the Nasdaq on the day off on nearly a percent. And it's the big loser of the week, down seven tenths of one percent. So that just lets you know the kind of this has been a little bit of a different week for the markets here. It's also been a different week for the bond market where we've seen a big move upward in yields to 4.3% as investors try to figure out what is the Fed going to do. I've also been watching what's going on, of course, with big tech as a part of that NASDAQ underperformance here. And if you look at the MAG7, these big cap stocks here, guess what? One of the MAG7 is actually up on the day. That is Tesla, which rose uh, about two thirds of 1%. But if you switch this one on over to the weekly look here, you see more green on the screen here. It looks like a Google up or Alphabet up the most on the week here. Tesla of the MAG7 down the most, about 6.7%. But what's notable here is it's getting more diversified. You're seeing more red and more green on the screen. You're not seeing this sort of buy everything tech that we have been seeing as of late, Josh. So, Julie, let's take a, a look at a name here. We don't talk about it too often, but it's an important one in today's trade. Reckitt uh, Benkiser. We need to chat this move, possible implications. So a jury in Illinois has awarded a woman $60 million in damages, saying its baby formula did lead to the death of her premature baby. That's specifically the label didn't warn of risks of a disease called NEC in its formula. Uh, now, Reckitt is responding, we, we should note that, disagrees with this verdict, emphasized that its product is safe, that it will appeal, but this clearly, as you can see there, really spooked investors. And we saw knock-on effects in other names too, Julie, like Abbott, which of course also makes infant formula. Exactly, and the reason that we're seeing not just Reckitt down as much as it is, those are the US listed shares, it's a, it's a UK-based company, uh, but in Abbott as well, is that now, analysts Analysts are saying, could we see a broader regulatory push on this very issue here? Um, saw one quote here from Hargreaves Lansdowne saying, based on the size of this fine, um, it suggests investor, which, you know, it's only a $60 million fine. So it's not large given the size of these companies. But what the share action suggests is that investors do expect there is perhaps more to come on this front here. And, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's too late for these companies to get out ahead of it and put some sort of warning on the label for premature infants. It's unclear exactly what's going to happen in this case. But um, Mead Johnson is the company that Reckitt Benkiser owns in the U.S. that sells this formula. And we should note, Abbott did tell Bloomberg in a statement that any allegations that its products are for premature babies are unsafe are without merit. Mm. We should note that. Moving on, stocks posting weekly declines, and it comes ahead of next week's key Fed meeting. Madison Mills is here with a look at some of the takeaways from the day. Madison. Well, it's a beautiful holiday here. I'm not talking St. Patty's Day. It's triple witching, you guys, yeah. which we love to talk about here, right? We've got a little bit of a sell-off going on, which could be related to these uh, options expirations tied to today to the tune of $5.3 trillion. So some of my sources at NICE this week were saying at the Stock Exchange that that could be one of the reasons that we're seeing a little bit of the volatility this week. The S&P 500's volume was 40% above average throughout today's trade partially due to those options expiring today. Now, one of the things that was interesting to know earlier in the week after we got some hotter than expected inflation data, and originally on, I think, Tuesday, the market was up after that data. Uh, again, when I was at the stock exchange, folks were saying, don't extrapolate this as a growth story. This is about uh, those options expiring on Friday. This is not about the market necessarily having some big take on the Fed and being OK with growth and inflation being higher for longer. Um, so I thought that was interesting to note, uh, given some of the volatility that we've seen today and the uh, obviously the red that we're seeing across the, all three of the major indices, I did want to point out one technical data point here that the last 21 years, the market has hit its March lows today. So a little mm. bit of uh, repeating of history here and that pullback to be expected after you've seen such record breaking rallies and record breaking highs day after day after day. I mean, the witching thing is so interesting to me because options activity is 
has exploded recently. I saw a figure today um, citing Goldman Sachs that trading in options has surpassed that in the stock market for the first time going back to 2021, which is based on notional value, how much the shares underlying options contracts are worth. It's, a, it's sort of how you calculate that. Um, and so we saw sort of during the pandemic when people were trading crypto, when they were trading meme stocks, they really got into options. But then it subsided. And now it's coming back again. It's really interesting. You can make so much more money that way. And I do wonder if part of it is tied to some of the changes that we're seeing in the labor market. I do a lot of Reddit sleuthing throughout the day <laughs> to see what the Wall Street Beds guys are talking about. And it does seem like a lot of the people who've been impacted by layoffs recently Ooh. have also been getting in on options trading. Uh, so I, that is completely just a personal take. We have no reporting to back that up. But I have noticed a lot more commentary on people People who have recently gotten laid off learning about trading in the options space. So I wonder if that's leading to a little bit more liquidity in that mm. area. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's in the Reddit. That's where you're checking that out? I mean, I'm on Reddit all day. I'm trying to get some takes from these guys. I'm also honestly- Do you get honestly, good takes? Do you I'm, get good takes from Reddit? Well, I'm trying to learn more about options. I'm interested. Honestly, we, got, so. we got the IPO next week. You know, know. Yeah. In, yeah. Well, we'll have to talk about that later when we talk about the IPO. Last thing, you were, though, you were watching, which I want to mention as well, is the treasury. What's going on in the treasury market this week? Yes, because we ha did see a big move upward in yields. Right, and the ten-year has made a complete road trip back to where we started. It's looking like we're at the 2024 highs. There, uh, move up by over 20 basis points over the past week. So, kind of a little bit of a round trip there, um, nearing the 2024 highs. Uh, J.P. Morgan today with a note talking about these treasury yields and also mentioning that they anticipate that there's a more likely than not chance that the dot plot that we're going to get next week at that Fed meeting will suggest 25 basis points of cuts next year. So I, I point that out because we continue to have these different narratives based on where you look. We've got this risk on trade, then you've got treasuries higher than ever, and then we're also saying the Fed's only going to get cut by 25 basis points this year. Pick your data point based on what narrative you want to go with for this market. It's a lot. We'll get our dots next week. Yeah, very exciting. Another holiday to look forward to. Yeah, Fed day. Exactly. It's going to be great. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, a number of software stocks hitting a speed bump in 2024 on tepid guidance, but Zscaler looking to switch up the narrative as it takes a leap forward in trying to harness the power of AI. The cloud security company ready to enhance its AI capabilities with an acquisition a company called Avalor that was announced yesterday. And Zscaler CEO Jay Chaudhry is joining us now. Jay, first of all, fantastic to see you. It's been a little while since we had the chance to talk, so it's good to see you. Thank you, Julie. So let's talk about Avalor here. This is an Israeli startup. And interestingly, as they wrote today, it's not started by security professionals, but rather programming folks who saw an opportunity here. Explain to people what they do here. They, they have what they call their data fabric for security. How should people mm -hmm. think about what that is exactly? Yeah, to really take advantage of data to really solve security problems with AI. You need to solve the data problem first, and then you need domain expertise of security. Yes, the founders of Avalor have done companies in the past where they know how to create data models with large amounts of data. Once you create models around the data, then we can write cyber applications to do faster, better detection of any of the threats out there after correlating it. So it's a perfect combination of Zscaler bringing security expertise and over 400 billion transactions a day logs. To do good AI ML security, you need the best data. Zscaler has the best data, Avalor has the best data fabric. The two together will, it's a, is a fascinating combination. You know, Jay, uh, I'm, I'm, it's good to see you. And I'm interested, Jay, also, you know, what is it, about American cybersecurity companies, they often, Jay, seem to find acquisition targets in Israel. You know, it's, it's not just you all, it's uh, you know, CrowdStrike and Palo Alto. What is going on inside Israel, Jay? It's a country, it's only nine million people, that American cybersecurity companies often do find targets there. There's a lot of innovation in cybersecurity in either Silicon Valley or in Israel. And we look for the best new innovative solutions and we have found them in Israel. We've done a couple of them in Israel before, but we look for wherever new innovation, new technology comes in to disrupt 
the legacy technologies. You know, Zscaler was founded to disrupt the old school firewalls, VPNs. We had done it extremely well in the case of Zero Trust Exchange platform we built. And now we want to do the same kind of disruption in this area where we need to handle logs and make sense out of it. So that's why it's a very exciting acquisition for us. So I'm curious, Jay, as you look at uh, what Avalor is going to provide you with and you combine that with mm -hmm. your zero trust uh, system, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. how, how much are you going to be able to see an increase in the capability of you know, preventing threats, for example, mm -hmm. preventing attacks? I mean, can, is there a way of quantifying sure. that? Yeah, so today <clears throat> we are an exchange where a switchboard for any communication by any user to any application. We do that extremely well. We are the market leaders in space. Now the logs that they get created because the communication need to be mined, need to be harnessed offline. And that's what Avalar allows us to do. With the data modeling, we can find incremental threats. It doesn't need to be a large number. If we take it from 96% to 97%, that's a big deal. And then we can feed it back to our inline exchange to offer a closed loop system that no one else offers. That's why the combination makes it very exciting and very unique opportunity for us. Jay, you know, you, you recently reported results and it didn't sound like you were seeing uh, any kind of customer fatigue like some peers such as Palo Alto suggested they were seeing, mm -hmm. correct? That is right. Why is that, Jay? You know, I don't know about them, but I do know that CIOs look for two things. One, cyber is fundamentally very important, but not just CISO, CIOs, and the board. Number two, there is some market uh, tightness out there, but if you can go and say, I can not only give you great cyber, but I can also reduce your cost, the, the deal move for, moves forward. We are one of the very few security companies that removes a lot of point products, lots of firewalls, VPNs alike. So the business case becomes very good. That's why we don't, aren't seeing any kind of spending fatigue. We are seeing fatigue for ELA as a bundles. Some companies like to bundle a lot of products and call it a platform, but it's nothing more than bundling. It becomes shelfware. And CIOs want to make sure they're not paying for any shelfware. So there's fatigue on that side, but customers are very focused on buying effective products that do the best cyber protection. Um, forgive me, Jay, what is ELA as a bundle? Oh, it's an enterprise agreement where companies say, take my 15 products, I'm going to give you for the price of 12. So it's a great deal. Take it, the customer really only wants eight. So the other seven sit as shelfware. Ah, gotcha, and there's, so there's decreasing demand for that. Well, what other changes, if any, either to the good or bad, are you seeing in demand appetite right now? The cyber security threats are at the highest. There's far more concern today than it was six months ago or 12 months ago. So it's not just on CISO's mind. With SCC asking for special reporting, with SCC suing solar bins, SCC suing the CISO. Everyone is worried about it. So demand is there. You need to show the customer that your products are not all legacy product. They are effective in cybersecurity and they save money. Then the thing happens. There is no lack of interest. There is scrutiny to make sure the solution works well and it gives good ROI. Jay, I'll get you out of here on this. Could you put uh, JAI in perspective for us, both from the attacker side and the defensive side. What, what, what are you bringing to the table on that front, Jay? Sorry, bring on what front? On uh, on, uh, when it comes to AI. Yeah, so AI is becoming more and more scary. Today, you can ask a simple question that says, please, chat GPT, show me all of my firewalls and VPNs that have vulnerabilities. In less than 30 seconds, you get a full list. So attacking companies is becoming easier, but we can fight AI with AI. By taking all the data we have, 400 billion logs we have, we use AI predictive and AI generative together to find some of the things that we could not find before. Now with AI, we can actually predict potentially 
where the attack would happen and when, because I can create an attack graph using all the data Zscaler has with some of the technology that Avalar brings to the table. So we think we are very excited to help our customers. My personal mission is really to really overcome all of these growing threats we are seeing out there. Jay, great to see you as always. Thanks for joining us. Julie, thank you for your time. Enjoy it, thank you. Have a great weekend. Oil giant Shell affirms its plan to reach net zero emissions by 2050 while shaking up its near-term ambition on emission cuts. Here with more, Yahoo Finance's Ines Frey. Hey, Ines. Hey, Julie. Yeah, that's right. So Shell scaling back some of its targets uh, for emissions and saying that it will aim to reduce its emissions, customer emissions from the use of its oil products by 15 to 20 percent. Uh, that is versus its prior 20 percent target. Also, uh, the company dropping a 45 percent reduction in net carbon intensity, citing uncertainty in the pace of change in the energy transition. Basically saying here, look, there's uh, the timeline for this energy transition is, all, uh, is, is out there. And, and we do know that countries around the world, governments around the world are looking uh, to reach net zero by 2050. So it takes certain steps to get there, but this comes also at the heels of BP uh, recently receiving a shareholder letter uh, last month or at, the, uh, or at the beginning of end of January, where uh, basically the shareholder, the activist shareholder, said that they need to scale back on their renewable energy strategy. This also comes at a time when renewable energies, by the way, are having a tough time because of this high interest rate environment. But basically, what this is showing you is that the uh, energy companies are sticking to their core business of fossil fuels while they're also looking ahead at this energy transition. And basically their argument is you still need fossil fuels in order to get to that energy transition. You have 80% of the world that depends on fossil fuels, that demand is coming from the, these, the majority of the world, and especially for the developing countries, you can't take away those energy sources because then the energy costs go higher, guys. Inez, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Coming up, investors awaiting the highly anticipated Reddit IPO. We're breaking down what to expect from the next social media stock to go public when market domination returns.
A big event for markets next week, Reddit's initial public offering. A company eyeing a valuation above $6 billion, but the social media platform still isn't profitable. Joining us now is Crunchbase News Senior Data Editor, Janae Tier. Janae, it is good to see you. Um, I'm just interested, Janae, what, what do you think the reception Reddit is going to be? Because it, it's an interesting name. Um, Janae, I don't, I don't actually know what the comp would be for a name like this, maybe you do. And you've got a, a company, it's been around a long time, Janae, but it's still posting losses, right? Net loss of around $90 million in, in 2023. How, how do you think, if you were to take a bet here, investors respond? Yeah, I think the signals here have been very mixed. I think some people feel like this is a little rich as a valuation. You know, they're targeting, I think, on the upper end, about 6.4 billion. And others are saying if this is a company that can still grow um, 18 years in, um, then it might not be so rich. So I think it's interest, it'll be interesting to see. Its revenues were around 804 million last year, and it did grow that 21%. Um, so if it can keep growing its revenues, um, then there is potential in the stock. But I think a lot of that revenue growth is more recent, and so I think there's a lot of doubt around whether this is a little rich. We have heard reporting that on the secondary markets, there is some purchasing around the $5 billion mark. So yes, it's a big IPO. It should be north of $5 billion. Whether $6.4 billion is a little rich, we'll wait and see. Well, and Janae, sort of to Josh's point, to drill down a little bit, what do you compare it to, right? Do you compare it to publicly traded social media companies or should people be thinking about it differently? I mean, how are, are the bankers thinking about it and valuing it? Com com what are they comparing it to? Yeah, I think it definitely is in the social media space or the attention economy. And I think there are a lot of companies old who've been around for a very, very long time and have huge audiences. And I would put um, Meta in that space, X in that space, YouTube. And then there's a lot of newer companies who've come out, the Pinterest, the Snaps, TikTok is obviously a big one. Discord, both TikTok and Discord are not public yet. So I think there are a lot of companies going after users, users contributing, users' attention. And then we also have the new AI space where a lot of companies might be moving away from search and more into using these new AI tools. So I think a lot of competition around um, this sort of social media space. I think most people are comparing it a little bit to Pinterest and to Snap. But I think in some ways, Reddit is quite unique. And I think, you know, we've seen companies gather a lot of attention or gain a lot of attention in the media, social media space, and then flame out and not quite kind of meet that growth potential. Facebook took out a lot of its competitors. So I think in some ways, the fact that it is still around 18 years on um, says something about the fact that this site offers something quite unique. It has all these subreddits more than 100,000 neighborhoods, they call it, or areas of communication. If you have a very niche interest or very, something very specific, you can go find it on Reddit. Um, some of the communities are in the tens of millions, some in the millions, some smaller. So I think the fact that it's 18 years in has 73 million daily active users means this company has been around a long time, but it has legs, and maybe there's opportunity for it to grow in, in 2024. How much, they, um, how much of a test do you think Reddit is for the broader IPO market? Meaning, if they made a debut and it doesn't go well, what kind of impact do you think that has? I think it definitely does have an impact. These very high profile brands that go out and how well or how poorly they do, the whole market is watching. Um, and we had that with Instacart. We've seen Instacart went out towards the end of last year. It's kind of been flat as a stock, um, so it hasn't performed brilliantly. And I think that has put a bit of a damper on companies looking to go out this year. What we're hearing from analysts is a lot of people are filing. There are a lot of companies with significant revenue who've got their balance sheets in shape, who do want to go out, but they don't feel that they have to rush it. And maybe they're looking towards the end of 2024, but we're more hearing about 2025 as the window for companies going out. If Reddit does very, very well, I think that shifts the landscape a little bit. Interesting. Um, and I should mention there's a disclosure that apparently the, the company just came out with. Um, so I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it says that the Federal Trade Commission is looking into Reddit's licensing of user data to AI companies. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're seeing happen, request to public, publicly traded companies. It's an issue, obviously, that people are paying a lot of attention to right now. 
Um, what do you think the risk is that something like that would hurt the sentiment around uh, the Reddit filing? Yeah, I think that definitely could because Reddit going forward is looking at AI it sees as a, as a completely new revenue stream. And if that were put in doubt, I think that would impact the stock quite significantly. You know, that deal was only signed in January of this year. And that revenue, I, I think with Google, it's 60 million a year each year for three years. And so that is a new revenue stream coming in. And it's looking to monetize more broadly with other platforms. No one has as deep pockets as Google, but certainly there are these other platforms that could pay for licensing. So it sees that as a whole new revenue opportunity. And in some way, these are, you know, it has a billion posts, um, even more comments. And so the fact that it's been able to build this trove of data over time that has this very, very active community that keeps building puts it in a great position for some of these AI training models. And if that were put in doubt, that would definitely impact the company's outlook. Yeah, really good point. We'll keep watching that story as it unfolds and we head towards the IPO next week. Janae Tier, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Time now for what to watch next week. Investors keeping a close eye on the Federal Reserve, of course, the second FOMC decision of the year taking place on Wednesday. While expectations for a rate cut are very low, the focus will be on the so-called dot plot. That will show FOMC members' estimates for rate cuts. Fed Chair Jerome Powell will hold a news conference following the decision, and Yahoo Finance will begin live coverage at 2 p.m. Eastern. And turning to one of the most anticipated IPOs of the year, the social media platform Reddit set to price on Wednesday between $31 and $34 per share. It will start trading Thursday on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker RDDT. Also turning to AI, NVIDIA's annual GTC conference kicking off on Monday. CEO Jensen Wong giving a two-hour keynote speech to start the festivities, and he'll outline what's ahead for the company in 2024. And moving over to earnings, Micron, General Mills, Five Below, KB Homes, Nike, and Lululemon all reporting next week. Micron announcing second quarter earnings after the bell. And finally, tune in next Monday and Tuesday for Yahoo Finance's coverage of Sarah Week from Houston, Texas. That's the big oil and gas conference. We've got interviews with Occidental CEO Vicki Holub on Monday, and you'll hear from ExxonMobil CEO Darren Woods on Tuesday. I'm heading down to Texas. Enjoy. So, yeah, should be quite interesting. That'll do it for today's Market Domination Overtime. Be sure to come back Monday for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance on the other side.
Uh, Fulton County judge has ruled that District Attorney Fannie Willis can continue to prosecute the 2020 election interference case of former President Donald Trump. Notably, this has led to Nathan Wade resigning from the Trump Georgia case following the judge's ruling. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman joins us now with the very latest. Rick. Hey guys, I know p people have a hard time keeping all these Trump cases uh, in track and keeping them all in perspective. So this is the Georgia case regarding election fraud and Trump's uh, insistence that uh, the authorities down there, Republicans, find a bunch of votes on, after the election so that Trump could win instead of lose. Uh, Trump lost that state to Joe Biden in 2020. So it now looks like uh, this case has been cleared to go forward. What the judge said is, um, look, this looked pretty bad. Um, he, he had some pretty um, critical words for Fannie Willis and the prosecutor, Nathan Wade, but he, he basically said, one of them needs to step aside in order for this case to continue. And I think not surprisingly, uh, Nathan Wade, the prosecutor, who at some point in the past, we're not sure exactly when, was uh, Fonny Willis's boyfriend. So he has said he's out. So uh, th that presumably resolves the conflict of interest or the apparent conflict of interest problem. So this case will go forward. I think Trump's team could probably find some way to appeal this and delay it further. Um, they, they have been appealing everything they can. Whatever whatever happens there, um, this is not one of the cases expected to make it to trial before uh, the election. A couple of the other cases may. There are four total criminal um, cases against Trump involving 91 felony charges, and this is just one of them. So this one is getting back on track after a delay. And let's talk about another one too. <laughs> uh, you said, as you say, it's difficult to keep them straight, but there's a, a New York hush money case as well that could be delayed. So what are the details in that one? So the delay here is actually not at Trump's behest. It's the prosecutors, uh, the district attorney, who says they just got thousands of pages of documents from the Justice Department, which charged Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's former lawyer and fixer, they, they charged Michael Cohen for matters related to these hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and another uh, pornography star Trump supposedly had an affair with. The, the Justice Department prosecuted Michael Cohen all the way back in 2018, so six years ago, and now the Manhattan, Manhattan District Attorney is saying only now are they getting some of these documents that the federal authorities gathered, so they need some extra time to go over them. I, I mean, you know, I guess when the professionals say the wheels of justice turn very slowly, this is what they mean. So the DA's office has asked for a 30-day uh, uh, pause. Trump's team has asked for a 90-day pause because they uh, have to go over those documents as well. And we, the judge has not yet said what he's going to do. So he'll probably grant at least a 30-day pause. He could split the difference and call it 45 days or 60 days or give the Trump team 90 days. If it's 30 days or 45 days, uh, this trial was supposed to get started um, within about 10 days. So if it's a one-month delay or something like that, it, there's a good chance this will still get underway and concluded by the time of the uh, election in November and perhaps by the fall. I, I, th I think that's what really matters here. Are any of these trials for, as a political issue actually gonna get get started and we're, are we gonna have any outcomes in these trials? And that's the one that, was, that seems closest. So that still could be on track for having a trial before election day, but we're gonna have to wait to find out. And Rick, I gotta get you out of here on this news of former Vice President Mike Pence saying he will not endorse Trump, Rick, of course, you know, Pence uh, did mount his own campaign and then had to drop out, didn't get any traction there. But what do you make of that, that headline? I don't think that's a surprise, but I think it could be important all the same. Uh, so, uh, you know, after what happened with Mike Pence, I mean, he went to the Capitol to certify the 2020 election and he was in the middle of the riots on January 6, 2021. And in some ways, right in the center of it with people shouting, hang Mike Pence. I don't think it's not surprising that he's not endorsing Trump. I think a big question is whether he he sort of actively campaigns against Trump. And this matters because of the evangelical vote, which Trump got a big chunk of in 2016. Uh, that is one of the reasons he beat Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, he got a slightly smaller chunk in uh, 2020. Joe Biden actually did better with Catholics in 2020 because Biden is a Catholic, um, but you know, Evangelicals have been a pretty important part of that weird coalition that Trump was able to put together. White working class voters, evangelicals, and a few others kind of gave him the margin in 2016. And if he loses evangelicals, I mean, I mean, if especially if Mike Pence would campaign against him, 
um, th that could be another thing that puts him, uh, you know, he's, he's looking pretty even with Biden right now, but that could put him at a pretty important disadvantage as we get into the fall. And Rick, just quickly, if Pence can campaign, campaigned against him, who would he campaign for? Like, who is he going to tell people to vote for then? You he's know, we've seen a lot of former, um, what you might call traditionalist Republicans, like the Lincoln Project people, uh, or there is another group called Republican Voters Against Trump. We have seen a lot of traditional Republicans actually campaigning for Joe Biden, and they're overt about it. They're, they're, they come out and say, it's not that I love Joe Biden. He is too liberal for me, but at least he represents uh, you know, functional government and normal democracy rather than whatever Trump re represents. And by the way, you can run against Trump or you could fund, I and mean, this is what one of the things super PACs do, they fund negative campaign ads against a candidate without necessarily endorsing somebody else. So um, he could go a bunch of different ways and it might make a difference. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, Rick, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. See you guys. The new sports streaming partnership among Disney's ESPN, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Fox has found its CEO. It's former Apple and Hulu executive. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexander Canal. She's been following this for more. Yeah, so now we have a little bit more context, a little bit more information when it comes to this skinny bundle between ESPN, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Fox. Like you said, Julie, uh, Pete DeStad is going to be the new CEO. He's a former executive of, at both Hulu and Apple, so he has that connection with Disney, which I think is important because he's going to be working across three different companies. So the fact that he's already uh, been at one of those three, I think is important. Now, he was at Apple for a decade prior to that. He was at Hulu for six years. But while he was at Apple, he was responsible for the business operations and global distribution of the tech giant's video and sports efforts. That included the launch of Apple TV in 2015, the eventual, eventual launch of the streaming service, Apple TV+, Plus, and then that $2.5 billion acquisition of MLS season pass in 2022. So he has the sports and streaming experience that these three companies had really been looking for. This is a service that's going Going to launch in the fall. We don't know the price point, but uh, Fox CEO Lachlan Murdoch said that he expects it to be on the higher end of estimates. Wall Street is estimating between 40 to 50 bucks a month, so expect to pay around that $50 range. He also said that he's, he expects subscribers to hit around 5 million in five years. So by the year 2029, and just to put that number in perspective, YouTube TV, which probably is going to be a pretty big competitor, that has more than 8 million mm. subscribers, and that launched in 2017. So we'll see. They're targeting the cord cutters, the cord nevers. I think a big question mark is going to come down to price and how much people are willing to pay for this type of service. What's being, up. Right now, Alex, like 40 to 50 you're hearing That's out there? That's the range. And, and he did say the higher range of estimates. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something between 50 yeah. to 55 bucks a month, which yeah. is a lot of money. But if you're a big deep. sports fan, yeah. I think those we'll people We'll see like how big that pay. audience is. Yeah. That's some money. Yep. Thank you, Allie. Appreciate Thank you. it. Coming up, new travel survey shows 91% of millennial and Gen Z respondents are planning on using travel hacks to save money in 2024. We'll dive into some of the more efficient ways to book a trip when Yahoo Finance returns.
hurts the auto rental company shaking up its C-suite, naming Gil West as chief executive officer as Stephen Scher steps down as CEO. West, the former chief operating officer of General Motors, uh, General Motors Cruise robo-taxi unit, uh, and the move coming after Hertz's bet on electric vehicles uh, fizzled out here. Um, he was also the chief operating officer, by the way, at Delta Airlines. Gil West, that is. The shares down about 3% in after hours trading. Remember, Hertz had been in bankruptcy. It exited in November of 2021 with share at the helm. And then he really did dive into the purchase of electric vehicles from a number of different companies, including Tesla. But, you know, part of these car rental companies' businesses is resale yeah. of those used cars. And we have seen a big drop in prices for things like Tesla's. And so that bet has not worked out well. Yeah, Tesla, well, they did make that big bet, as you said, Julie, went, went, once Tesla decided that they were gonna slash prices, um, you know, Elon Musk made it clear he was more interested in volume than margins, that they got nailed on it. Yeah, exactly. I mentioned they exited back bankruptcy in November, 2021. At the time, the share offer $29 a share. Today, the shares closed at $7 and 58 cents. So that gives you an idea of the collapse in the stock. So we'll keep watching it here and uh, see if we hear anything directly from Gil West about the strategy in the coming days. Gen Z and millennials are becoming airport dads. That's what a new survey from Amex Travel is looking like. Many younger travelers meticulously planning trips to make sure they make the most out of every dollar. Here to help us break down the latest travel trends, Amex Travel President Audrey Hendley. Audrey, thanks for being here. So um, what sort of stood out to you from this study? Is it that, you know, these folks are spending sort of more time and more care in planning their travel? It's a few things that stood out, particularly because we're really watching the trends with millennials and Gen Zs. They're the up and coming travelers uh, and they're very ambitious about traveling the world. We heard that they're using travel agents. They have all these travel hacks that they use to get themselves around the world. They're traveling for sporting events and there's a lot of them actually traveling solo around the world. And Audrey, I'm, I'm curious, when we talk about millennial and Gen Z, um, you, you've got a lot of data and insight there. Are they, are they now traveling more than boomers? And if so, are you kind of adjusting your products and services to cater to that? Yeah, we continue to adjust our travel. For American Express, we acquire a significant number of new customers that are millennials and Gen Zs. So we've done all kinds of things like change the uh, experience in our travel airport lounges. We've continued to modify the hotels we work with and the destinations that we serve. Um, it's an iterative process, as you can imagine. We've been in the travel business for over 100 years, so it's a lot of innovation, it's a lot of talking to customers, and as you say, a lot of looking at a lot of data. Um Another number that surprised me is that 58% of millennial and Gen Z respondents want a travel agent or a trusted advisor to help them book their trip. Now, my grandma was a travel agent. I, I, the, you know, I think of like a travel agent, you go into the office, there's the posters of the different um, places that you visit, which I imagine is not really what a travel agent looks like now. So can you help us explain like who these people are turning to for this help? Yeah, well, we have thousands of experts around the world, and you're right that, like everything else, the role of the travel agent has been modernized. Um, these customers are going to travel agents because they want their, it kind of ties with their desire to go further and to have a more like bigger expedition types of trips. They're typically more expensive and they're further away. So they're turning to travel agents to you know get more insights, plan it a little better, and really think about the experience they want to have when they get to the destination. So travel agents have changed in what they do, but they still add a tremendous amount of value, particularly on those bigger and more expensive trips. And Audrey, you know, you, you all there at American Express, you've been helping people travel around the world for a, a long time. I'm just interested when you when you look at the, the trends right now and the data, Audrey, is travel, you know, generally, is it about as strong as you expected right now? Yeah, demand continues to be very strong. And uh, we're seeing a lot of difference though in terms of where what people want to do when they get to the destination. They're being a little bit more spontaneous. They're not going by the list as much as they used to. And they're trying to figure out itineraries that create like longer memories because they're going further away, the trips are getting more expensive, and they're really being intentional about where they go on their vacation. Audrey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Going into the weekend with travel on the mind. Appreciate it. Thank you.
That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Companies across industries continue to navigate the challenges of ransomware attacks. Just this year, Russian-backed attackers have targeted two major companies, United Health Group's Change Healthcare and tech titan Microsoft. For more on the rise in cybercrime, we're joined by Todd McKinnon, who is the Okta co-founder and chief executive officer. Todd, great to speak with you as always and, and scratch, uh, well, get some time with you. Uh, you know, first and foremost, what, what is really prompting this rise in cyber attacks that we're seeing and additional threats? Well, as we, as an industry and an economy and a society move more and more information and transactions online and reap the benefits of that and ease of use and productivity for our companies, that's also where the, that's also where the, uh, the bad guys can make money. And that's where they're going after these things. You, you, you mentioned a couple examples and it's where the money is, it's where the vulnerabilities are and that's where they're going. And that's what we have to do as an industry is defend that. So Todd, how do you defend that? How, how do you navigate what what is an escalation here within the landscape? And then also on the flip side, just what is that then doing for demand for your product? Do you think it would be a real uptick in demand? Well, the the cybersecurity industry as a whole is a is a large and growing industry. The the specific part of it we play in, which is called the identity management part of cybersecurity, is even more important than it was five years ago or ten years ago. And that's because as more things move online, the old technologies like firewalls and, and virtual private networks aren't going to cut it. You have to have a strong identity system. And when you look at these attacks, in fact, you mentioned a couple examples, the Microsoft attack or the United Healthcare uh, Group attack, it, over 80% of them involve a, a compromised identity. So there's somewhere in that chain of attack, there's an account that's taken over, there's a, a insecure password that's used that the threat actors compromise and, and use that to either initially land the attack or to pro, uh, to promote the attack within within the infrastructure. So identity is a big part of the defense and that's why 
uh, were so important to our customers stepping up, helping them defend themselves against these identity-based attacks. You know, Todd, when we think about how much we've all kind of leaned into two-factor authentication as we need more safety, how far away are we from now having to think about three-factor authentication? I think there's, I would, when you talk about identity-based attacks, I think the first challenge is, is knowing the breadth of the accounts and the identities companies have in their ecosystem. So when you're talking about a company's corporate IT environment, especially for a sizable company, anyone over you know a couple hundred employees, it's pretty daunting to know all of the systems and networks and SaaS applications and data centers and servers in those data centers, trying to get a catalog of it all and comprehensively ha have a, a way and an approach to manage all of that. That's the first challenge. And the second challenge, as you mentioned, is not only to make sure that there's the right types of authentication methods on those accounts, you know, making sure they're very secure, like the modern authentica authentication methods aren't passwords, it's things like biometrics. So you can just log into your system by using your fingerprint or your or, or a face ID. Um, passwords are really not the modern way to do it. They're, they're the most vulnerable, they're the most secure. So comprehensive knowledge of what you have in your ecosystem, and then the ability to put the right strong level of, of checking that the person is who they say they are on each of those accounts. That's what identity management is, and that's why demand for our products is, is high. And Todd, speaking about demand for your product, also scaling the business, you recently closed uh, one of your recent acquisitions. Talk to us just about how that then positions you for further long-term profitable growth and what that runway looks like for Okta. We're very excited about the product roadmap, and it's it's moving in the direction that that I just spoke about. So, uh, moving from from a, a platform that can comprehensively connect employees to all of their technology and customers to all all of the technology, whether it's a new mobile app or a website a company is building, moving more toward a a, a product suite and a platform that can have visibility into the entire internal set of services and cloud servers and on-premise servers and manage all of the um, accounts in those servers and give the companies a comprehensive view of all potential identity-based threats across the environment. That's that's what we're looking to do, and that's what customers are responding with 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 a healthy demand in the environment. Hey Todd, while we have you, uh, you know we were able to speak with one of your industry uh, colleagues more broadly, a uh, CEO over at CrowdStrike, George Kurtz, and and we had to ask about this election season. And I wonder from your purview, the role that cybersecurity plays in global elections, where you've got almost half of the world's population that it's expected to go to the polls and to the ballots. I mean, it's not just elections. I mean, it's, it's not just any time of year. It's, it's a constant thing now with so many more processes and workflows moving online. Uh, and we talk about not only the actual voting part of elections, which is not online yet in most cases, but a lot of the media and a lot of the influence of as voters go to the polls, what they, where they get their information, we're, uh, as an industry, we're, we're, we're really focused on making sure we know what authentic information is online. And a lot of that comes down to identity. How do you know, is it a bot on X that's posting or is it a real person? How do you know um, where the actual content is coming from that is kind of supporting different candidates and supporting different causes? That's an identity problem. And uh, both Okta and the industry can help make sure that those things are genuine and that uh, voters know what they're really, when they're learning about things, they know it's accurate and complete and they can make the right decisions at the polls. All right, Todd McKinnon, great to have you here. Octo's co-founder and chief executive officer. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you.